So the first um, challenge is really identifying the fragile athlete. So if we look at these two athletes, which of these two is fragile? And typically, one would choose the athlete on the, the athlete's makeup on the right. So this is the archetypical um, fragile athlete that perhaps pops into the mind of many clinicians when we're talking about fragility. Lightweight athletes, typically female, low body mass, low body fat, reduced energy intake, all sorts of hormones and um, musculoskeletal issues, which I'll come back to. But what about this athlete? Uh, if Shaquille O'Neal was running down the ba uh, basketball court at me, I would not stop to think, is he fragile? But in fact, actually in the United States, he's considered to be one of the most fragile athletes of all professional sport over a course of time. And maybe he missed these number of games, that's probably why his career lasted so long. But I suppose the general message is you can't necessarily tell by uh, initially looking at an athlete whether they may be fragile or not. So how do we recognize fragility? Well, the easiest, I suppose, approach would be just recognizing a fragility injury uh, when we see it. And we talk about fragility injuries often in relation to bone injuries. So bone stress fractures are often uh, categorized into those that are fragility, in other words, they shouldn't have happened, um, or um, traumatic, one expects them to happen. And although we have that mindset with bone stress injuries, uh, we sometimes forget to ask ourselves, um, should basic muscular soft tissue, uh, soft tissue strain injuries happen? You know, a grade one hamstring tear, often people don't stop to think, hang on a minute here, um, should this have happened and why, why has it necessarily happened in this athlete? Or the patient who presents with an inflammatory insertional Achilles tendon problem, why? And could there be an underlying disease process like psoriasis? So the, the first step to recognizing fragility is perhaps recognizing it through the initial presentation. But we probably have an awful lot more patients who we recognize as being fragile because they keep turning up to practice. Recurrent injuries, um, or presenting with a number of different injuries over the course of time, soft tissue and or bone. Um, a fragile athlete would be considered to be one who is returning to play with an active injury, as so many high performance athletes do um, under the circumstances of their contracts. Um, patients who have underlying diseases, um, underlying deficiencies, vitamin disease, vitamin deficiencies, um, and the patient who is slower to recover or slower to return to play, um, sometimes it's get a, it, we lose sight of how long it's actually taking a, an athlete to get back to play, but those individuals should be picked out as being the fragile athlete. Um, individuals who have recurrent illnesses, not necessarily because there's something systemically wrong with them, but they have long periods of time out, and every time they come back into sport, their injury um, vulnerability is quite high and also patients with uh, mental health issues just because as I'll discuss it will affect their ability to go through the rehab process. Now an athlete might be fragile in some environments and they might not be fragile in other environments. The sport obviously has a big role because um, individuals tend to get selected into the sports that they're more resilient in but that's not always the case but when we come back to the actual essential makeup um, of the athlete, uh, those are the factors that really when we're screening mm -hmm. athletes and looking at them and looking for ri risk factors, uh, those are the things that we're particularly interested in in the, in the clinic. So these factors, we'll all recognize these. Being female is um, a high risk and uh, multiplies the risk of lower limb injuries several fold and much slower to respond to rehabilitation. Now, that's often um, claimed to be because of the link to hypermobility, but actually it's much more linked to the um, tendency towards uh, proprioceptive deficits and lack of trunk control. So we certainly recognize a much higher incidence of um, ACL uh, ruptures in female athletes in high impact sports, and to some extent, but not quite extreme, ankle injuries as well. Hypermobility isn't the diagnosis, it's usually the start of the diagnosis. We know that this um, combination of low body mass, low body fat um, and low energy intake leads on to what we call classically the female athlete triad. Um, and 
you know, when one sees an athlete of this type of physical makeup, it's something you're going to think about pretty quickly in terms of uh, their health risks. Um, and we know that the, the threshold for adverse to effects to happen, which I'll describe in a minute, in other words, changes in endocrine function, changes in musculoskeletal healing, problems with bone health, tend to happen when energy intake drops below 30 kilo kilocalories per kilogram of fat-free mass per day. So everything slows down in order to try to make energy available um, to just survive. Uh, and that's the principle of this um, athletic triad that, that we discuss. Now, the, the group are in, who are in the red zone here are the easy group to pick up. And these are the ones who don't have periods. They have um, easy bone stress injuries. They have um, uh, eating disorders usually. Um, but actually, the difficulty is that a lot of the people that we see who come in and they have recurrent injuries, whether they're recurrent soft tissue injuries, they're recurrent bone injuries, or they're just slow to heal, will fall into this group here where it's clinically much more difficult to pick these up. I see probably 25-30% of my cases of athletic triad patients are male and they have the same type of responses to thinness and um, reduced hormone function etc and they will often present with the same type of scenario of, of uh, fragility in terms of easy injuries and slow recovery. Now what about the excessive body weight the, the, the theory about Shaquille O'Neal, if you look at his career and the pictures of him through his career, he's a big, big guy, and he was often quite fat, actually. Um, and a lot of his body weight was um, upper body. And one of the theories about excessive adiposity, even in top-class athletes, is that it's pro-inflammatory, so it continues to drive the injury. Uh, then there are the obvious mechanical effects of carrying excessive body weight. And what we don't know is when an athlete has got an intra-articular injury, for example, or a lower patellar tendinopathy, what is the ideal body weight for that athlete? Because they usually have to be lighter to compensate for their injury, um, but they may, not be, uh, they may be too light to continue successfully with resilience in their sport. Fragility due to medical conditions, there are all sorts of different types of medical conditions and effectively most of them can predispose to um, impaired soft tissue healing. And then just lastly, in terms of the um, factors that might drive injuries, um, this is a paper from young about young athletes in, in a variety of different sports and anxiety, mistrust, negative coping strategies and, and, and stress. Um, all contribute to um, the risk of injury, not just the poor recovery from them. One of the really interesting aspects of all of this is that if you look at one of the strongest predictive factors of returning to play, it's self-efficacy. You'll find that self-efficacy often will come out as being one of the top predictive factors of an individual's return to function, to work, to sport, to whatever you can measure readiness to return to play because if an athlete isn't psychologically ready there's no way that they should be returning. With a note on resilience, resilience is actually from our perspective it's the psychological side of managing injury and there is no um, uh, serious athlete who really hasn't um, uh, pot potentially constructively been through an injury and hasn't learned the psychological resilience that they they need to. Big big topic, fragile athlete, I've touched on a few very simple areas, um, but you could really st leave, be left with the conclusion that there are an awful lot of fragile athletes out there and maybe we overlook some of those that we need to um, uh, treat in a different way. Um, and uh, always consider them when patients are presenting with uh, recurrent injuries or slow to recover injuries. But the, the psychological aspects and the resilience training in a lot of these patients will go um, sometimes much further than some of the physical elements will. Thank you very much.